You're listening to the Rent Roll Radio Show with Sterling Chapman. Hey, Rent Roll Radio listeners, welcome back to the show. As always, I'm your host, Sterling Chapman. Today, we're joined with a super special guest. I'm super excited to have him on. Today, we have Corey Peterson. So for those of you who have been out there in the multifamily or the real estate space for a while, I'm sure you've seen his his names, his advertisements. I, I love the Corey Peterson ads, man. They're, they're the most entertaining ones on Facebook. So, uh, I was super, uh, super grateful to meet him in person at the best ever conference a few weeks ago and got him to agree to come on the show and share some of his wisdom with us. So Corey, welcome to the show. And thank you so much for having us. Oh man, Sterling, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this episode. Awesome. Corey, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about your story. For those of us who don't know you, who, uh, who are you, where'd you come from and, and what'd you do before you got into real estate? Yeah, I was a, uh, well, I started off as a used car salesman. We'll put it that way if you want to go way far back. <laughs> but, um, you know, I got a really unique story because it, success doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen if you believe it. And for me, uh, I had a lot of hope and I had a lot of ambition. I wanted to be somebody, but I was not formally educated. I didn't have a college degree. I was actually a Las Vegas pool boy for a minute, right? Nice. Uh, at the Stardust, if you remember where that used to be. <laughs> Um, best three summers of my life, by the way, but, um, but I learned the hustle, I guess I learned how to, I learned how Vegas works. That's for sure. But, um, I remember sitting, um, as a, you know, 18 years old, just thinking about life and I knew that I was going to be successful. I just didn't know how, and, um, I didn't find real estate. It was actually like almost 20, 23 years ago. And I'll give you the short version of it, but, um, and that's really when my life really forked and changed forever. But, uh, I was, uh, my mom was married to this man named Bruce. I'll call him Bruce Wayne. Okay. He wasn't Batman, but <laughs> Bruce was loaded. He had lots of money. And he had a house in Kauai, the garden Island of Hawaii. And so we go there and we didn't know it, but it's right on the beach. And, and my mom was married to this guy. And I say we, cause it was my uh, girlfriend that went with me. Now my wife of like 20 years, uh, we went there together for the first, that was like our first real vacation together as a boyfriend nice. and girlfriend. It was really cool. It was magic. And Bruce had a house right on the beach. And I remember we walked out of the beach and it was on this cove. And so we walked the beach early. And so if you're not a morning person, you will be when you get to Hawaii, right? Because of the time zone change, right? So if you're sure, not used sure. to watching the sun come up, <laughs> you will when you get there. So we, you know, wake up at five o'clock in the morning. We're like, let's go do something. So like, we just go walk this, this cove walk in the cove and all of a sudden there's like a fresh water stream that's going from a river into the ocean it was really cool and majestic and mountains in the background and then we get to the the point and all of a sudden you know the sun starts to rise and i remember sitting there just hand in hand with my wife and and we sat there and and was still for a minute you know for about 15 minutes felt like 20 minutes and just let my spirit renew it was like i was on empty and as that sun was coming up, it was just like my, my meter was going higher and higher. I was getting fulfilled and renewed because at, at that point in my life, I was, I was a, a restaurant manager and I hated my life. I hated what I was doing. I wasn't fulfilled at all. And I just wanted to be successful. And uh, I just like to say the scales of everything of life had fell off and I could see clearly for the first time. And I remember looking over at Bruce's house and I was like, gosh, dang, what does this guy do? Because Bruce had the two things I think we're all looking for, which was time and money. And nice. he had it unequivocally, right? Nice cars, fine art. So I was like, and I'd never seen wealth like that. And I was like, what do you do? So I finally asked, him, I got off the guts to ask him what he did. And then he said the magic words, he said he was in real estate and they owned apartments. Nice. So I left the island thinking that Bruce was the big kahuna. <laughs> um, and, um, and so, uh, but I, it, I wish the story got better from there because Bruce was a grumpy old man. And my mom was really pretty. <laughs> Don't <laughs> judge my mom. Okay. She got me to Hawaii and changed my life. Um, but uh, so Bruce was not going to teach me, but about six months later, I read that little purple book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. Sure. And my mind was like, oh my God, that's Bruce. That's what Bruce did. And I saw that it was achievable, that maybe I could do it. And so that's when I went on a relentless journey in real estate, you know, self-educating, reading all the books, 
wasn't going to webinars and seminars back then, but I was just reading. And I finally, in 2005, I got enough uh, courage that I was ready to do it. I, I, I said, I'm ready. And I was like, well, what do I call my company? I want to create a company, what I call it. And all I could do was think about Bruce and like he was the big kahuna. And so I called my company Kahuna Investments. And I had no idea that it would be so sticky because people, when I usually go to a lot of events, people never call me Corey. They just call me Kahuna. Hey, what's up, Kahuna? Nice. And, and I found that I live my brand really well, right? Because that is my brand, sunsets and palm trees, that cash flow life. And so, um, um, so when I started, I started off as a fix and flip person. Uh, well, I started actually wholesaling, um, finding some deals, selling it to people with money, um, and then, and then finally found my first piece of private money and, um, was doing that well, real well. And then I hit another roadblock where, uh, you know, uh, I was working my tail off and, and didn't see a lot of end of the road for it in the single family space. And I, uh, I transitioned to apartments in 2011 and now we own $250 million worth of, uh, commercial real estate and, um, life is really, really good. Nice. So nice. that's the short version, but yeah, I, I feel like you skipped some juicy parts. So before, I, we I did. Were, before we were recording, you were telling me about uh, the life you had before real estate in the, um, in the financial advisory space. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Yeah. So here's what happened. Um, when I first started uh, doing my, I actually started off as I, I took a home equity line of credit on my house. I got like 25 grand. And I was like, and so I did, like, I was looking at the yellow pages. That's how dated this is, right? I was calling REO uh, be companies, banks. And I called the American Airlines Federal Credit Union, like number one. And I called the credit union. And I did like three flips. And then I did three rental properties after that. I bought three rentals. The problem was I took all that profit that I made from those flips, put it into each rental. And then I was like, oh, I'm making 200 bucks a month per property cash flow and, and i had no more money and, I, and I, I thought i was so good i quit my job so <laughs> then i didn't have a job and so i was like well shit i don't know what to do and, and i'm trying to so i'm like i'm gonna have to go i didn't know how to get out of that rut so the only thing was to i need to go find a new job but i need to find a better job right and so at first i thought i was going to go and go back to school and be a pharmacist and the only reason i could think <laughs> about a pharmacist was like those guys make a hundred thousand dollars right out of school and you can, um, you make, you know, you get a good degree and do it. So I was like, okay. So I was already starting to go to school, the chemistry classes and all this stuff. And <laughs> so then I go to, I go to dinner one time with my wife's friends, uh, her, her friend and her boyfriend and her boyfriend was a financial advisor. And after talking with him for about an hour and a half, he's like, Corey, he goes, you just don't strike me as a guy that can sit behind a counter every day <laughs> and count pills. He's like, you sure you want to do that? He goes, why don't you be a financial advisor? It's pay you way better and you won't have any debt, right? And I was like, well, that sounds cool. I go, but don't you got to have a degree to be a financial advisor? He said, no, you just got to pass a test. Well, that's the hardest uh, test I've ever studied for in my life. <laughs> I passed with a 72 right? So that was really just, I studied just enough, right. but I passed. I got my series sevens and a series 66 uh, in insurance license. And I got on with Edward Jones. Now, um, so Edward Jones, and for anybody that doesn't know, if you see an Edward Jones guy, just know that that guy is a BMF, right? And if, if you know what a BMF is, go Google it. <laughs> Bad mofo. Because they have a gauntlet that weeds out people that don't can't hack it. And so just to give you an example, I had to go, um, I door knocked for three years. Edward Jones gave me a laptop, a printer, a story, a company to stand behind and, and said, the rest is up to you. And, but they had a, a pattern and it was like, you go and door knock. I went door to door every day for three years for at least five hours a day. Um, saying, Hey, my name is Corey Peterson. I, you know, I'm with Edward Jones. I'm getting ready to, I'm getting ready to open an office down the road. <laughs> it's going to be somewhere over here. I think, <laughs> um, you know, how's the, how's the market treating you? And, and I built an investor base. And so I did that. And, uh, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. 
And it took about two and a half years to really get to the point where you get a certain a, a number of assets under management. Because I started off what's called a new new, no assets and, and no no nothing. And once you get to a certain point, then Edward Jones opens up its green doors and says, oh, here's an office. Um, here's a secretary. Here's furniture. And I, I, was, I went legit. And it was a great feeling. Um, but it was short lived because uh, in 2000, so I started off in 2006. So 2006, seven, eight. And then the crash happened, right? Really. And what we're talking about, it was, man. So, and Edward J Jones does a really good job of trying to be diversified. And our clients, probably middle America, average Joe, um, you know, doctors, dentists, lawyers, um, but not, you know, million dollar investors. And, and so these, you know, we're diversifying their portfolio. But when the market crashed, because, you know, you, you go in there thinking like you are a financial advisor. I'm watching out for you, Mr. and Mrs. Client. But the fact of the matter is, it's just not true, right? If, yeah. I, if I told you what financial advisors talk about when they're by themselves in their groups yeah. and they're talking. They're, they're selling you insurance. <laughs> they are not talking about your best interest. Let's put it that way. Right. Sure. They're talking about how much money they're making off of you. And what yeah. their fees are and how many assets under, under management it's it was really it's really shitty actually it's really yeah. it it blew my mind um but that's the talking and hey listen i'm not going to say that i got didn't get sucked into that a little bit right and there comes a point and so here's here's i ended up getting fired from that job and here's the reason why um and it's really weird that you, say, you know i got fired from a job and but man up until that point you know you're you're I had a client that came in probably 2007 or something like that had a, you know, saved all their life, retired from Intel. I went and we have the Intel office right next in Arizona by my, where my office was at had $2 million saved around $2 million and proud, right. Yeah. At retirement, him and his wife came in, you know, 2007, we diversified the portfolio in 2009 they come in and I'm telling you, it was a somber meeting. And I remember the, the wife sitting and I'm telling you, she was just, her husband looked distraught. Right. And you know, it was like visibly kind of, it was, it's hard to describe what, what they look like, but I'm, and she was almost weeping, just weeping because they were asking the question. Right. And it's the question anybody in retirement asks. And the question is, is it enough? Am I going to run out of money? And for them, the answer was yes. If you keep living the way you're living, the way we'd set up this plan, it's not going to look good. You're going to have to drastically cut everything. And that's not what they wanted to hear, but they knew. And then now... This is where I real. This is when I realized I had a hey, number one as a financial advisor. I had no control. Whatever I sure. thought I knew about the market was bull crap. Sure, sure. And the, and here I, I, I heard some statistic that like ninety seven percent of those like actively managed portfolios don't outperform like the S and P or something. Yeah. yeah. So it's just a way to, to another way to just get more money from somebody sure. every year, right? One percent every year instead of a, a you know up front load, they'll just take it a year every year for the rest of your life. So, but here's here's what's even worse. So, as now your advice would be, hey, listen, you're you're sixty five, you still have a long time of retirement. Let's cut our lifestyle now. But let's not change any of the investments because they will come back. Mm -hmm. But this is what happens. And it's everybody says they're a long-term investor until shit happens. And for them, that was, they're like, no, Corey, we want out. We want out, get us out of the stock market, get us out. And it already dropped, right? Half. So the 2 million is now 1 million. It's a, you know, 201K, not a 401K. And 
so, and then to move their money, guess what I have to do? Charge them a fee. Yeah. To add injury to insult, right? And that just didn't sit right with me, man. I, I couldn't. And so my heart left the business at that moment. I, I met, like, when that happened, I was like, this, this sucks, dude. This is not what I saw. My, you know, I have no control. I'm just taking, I'm a con artist. That's what it felt yeah, like. Sure. And as soon as my uh, sales or my heart left, so did my sales, right? Yeah. I wasn't calling people like I used to. Dude, there was no passion behind it's, it. It's different. You know, when you, in all sales, you have to, you know, I've been in sales my whole life. I've managed sales teams and, and you can, I've never seen a team effectively sell something that they know is not right for the person. Like I'm yeah. not, not sustainably. I've seen some con artists come in and, and put up, you know, for a few months, but never any sustainable results. And, and those insurance companies and those wall street companies and those stock brokerage companies, they indoctrinate their employees with the, the Wall Street wash. They are the best. This is the best thing for them. But once once the cover's blown, you can't go like as decent human beings, you and I can't go up to these old people who have been rubbing nickels together since the depression to try and form a basic life together and know that we're we're lying to them to, you know what I mean? Hustle them out of their retirement. And, yep. and once, once you have that, you know, pulling it, you, you can't, you just can't walk in and, and pitch it the same way. Never. Right. And so that's what happened. <clears throat> and so my sales went down. <clears throat> um, and then I had that appointment with my manager, at like 10 o'clock, you know? And uh, so I show up at eight o'clock and when I walk in the door, my secretary can't even look at me. And I'm like, I know <laughs> it's on. And so I was like, gosh, the first thing I did was I went and print a, printed a client list and put it in my truck <laughs> sure. and locked the yeah. door. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, but here's what happened. And, and now, so now, and I want to make sure I, uh, this is the change and, and I'm going to tell you now I've studied it now. And I, I know that anybody that's successful, like really successful, there was something that was a fork in the road that really moved it and changed everything. And here's my moment. I know I'm in my office all by myself, kind of like my office now, no windows. And <clears throat> I know in two more hours, I'm gone. And I got to start making a plan. Where's what, what's my plan B? And I already knew what my plan B was, man. I, that little kid, that little person inside you that used to believe that he could do anything that he put his mind to, man, he was like, put me in coach. Like I'm ready. Like, cause I want to do real estate. Right. I, I want And I knew every book that I ever read said <laughs> the guys that made the biggest gains were in the biggest depression er time, no areas. Sure. Right. And I'm like, this is one that we'll probably never see again. I got to do it. And so, I, and, and, but here's that young kid, that voice inside that young kid battling with this 30 year old, 32 year old saying, I got a wife, I got two kids. I got responsibilities. I got, I got job. I, I got to make income. We still depend on my money and my wife makes some money, but, but we still depend on mine too. And that was the struggle. It was an internal struggle. And I'm sitting there just battling it right there in my office with no one else watching. And I finally, I'm proud to say that little kid kicked that little 30 year old's ass. Right. And I remember sitting in my office and, and I made the most deep down gut wrenching. I'm, I'm talking everything that I am commitment. And I made it to myself with no one else watching that I was going to do whatever it took to be successful in real estate. And I would never look back and I would burn every bridge along the way. And man, I'm telling you, dude, Sterling, that's all I've done. That's all I've done since, man. And I'm telling you everything that I've needed in my life with real estate. And I didn't, at that time, I didn't even know how I was going to do it. I just knew that I was willing, as long as it was legal and ethical, I was willing to do whatever it took.
If it said three o'clock is the is the bar, you gotta be at three o'clock in the morning every every night. Boom, I'm in. What? No problem. And so I left at ten o'clock. I got fired, and I remember coming out, and I was like Rocky, dude. <laughs> That lasted for like 10 minutes, by the way, sure, sure. followed by utter terror, because now I had to go <laughs> home and tell my wife. <laughs> now, and I will say this, my wife did me the I will I will forever be um, in debt to my wonderful wife and bless her soul, because, you know, I came home and I said, honey. Yeah, I got, you know, I got canned because I already told her, I said, there was the possibility. And I was like, <laughs> it happened. And I was like, but here's what I want to do. I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to go do real estate. I'm going to do it full time. I don't even, and I'm telling her, I, I don't even know how exactly I'm going to do it, but I'm looking at her in that way. Like, honey, I promise you, you watched me door knock three years for Edward Jones and how hard that was. I, I will, this is nothing. I will, I will fix this. And and she said to me, the best things I could ever hear is like, I believe in you. Right. And then she said, but don't fail. Cause what was <laughs> that? What was on the line was my family. They say money, you know, doesn't mean everything, but like run out of money and see how long your marriage lasts. Sure. Sure. Right. And so it was for real. And, um, and then I just went and I hustled brother. I, so Jones taught me some great gifts. So it taught me the money game. It taught me how to speak and talk to a very uh, sophisticated person that really understood money. And I understood money and I understood what people were getting. I understood. Uh, and also Jones had taught me how to network, how to put myself in positions and where money hangs out. Sure. I was doing all those activities already. And so uh, I just took that skill set, And, and the, part of that's why I, um, I wrote a book called copy your way to success because I feel like that's all I've ever done in my life is I've just, I say use the word copy, but I'll call it modeling, right? Sure. The, Tony Robinson's better way is called modeling. Copy's a strong word, right? Yeah, it's yeah, teachers yeah. pissed off, but, um, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm an expert copier. And then I'm, I can model things that work really well. There's no reason and, to reinvent the wheel, dude. I'm, I'm taking notes. I, everything I do, I stole from somebody. I'm, shit i need to do this like Corey. Should yeah. I need to do this like you yeah know what I mean? and that's all i've done man like people say well gosh that's really you know um and then once you master something that's when you start putting your little tweaks right and so i'll i'll uh i would love to talk about how i raise money uh here in a bit because uh, yeah. i think that's a place where i i started off doing it the way i learned it and then i tweaked it to do something that i think is more better more yeah. better Let's hear about it. How are you raising right. money? I got my notepad out for this one. All right. So let's just, this is for everybody. Get it. Yeah. If you're listening to this right now, you got to take mental notes. Cause this is, this is powerful when you really understand it. Now I got to put some premises here for how I think, right? I think that Corey works extremely freaking hard. I, I work hard to find deals. I work hard at making sure they are, they're profitable. I work hard on managing it out along the way. I am very vested in my deals, like everybody else probably is too. The difference is I believe I should get paid for it, right? Yeah. And I don't care. I don't care. And I think that's my attitude now is I don't care. Um, meaning, so let's just set up what most people do, okay? Most people, they're going to do a syndication and they'll say, oh, let's just make it a... 80 20 split what do you say 75 25 what do you think sterling what's somewhere what's between average? 80 20 and 70 30 yeah okay there you go so somewhere in that and, the, and there's like that little balance right and they're like okay and so that 25 percent is usually going to the gp right mm -hmm. let's go we'll cut it and so 75 25 right that's probably what most people are looking to do or 70 30 something like that where 30 percent of that deal goes to the gp side now in that gp you could have a partner maybe you have two partners maybe you have three partners right so it's really not 30 it's you know 15 what if you had a partner that had half right and so you start looking at all these things you're like oh that's that's not a whole lot of juice you know you don't get paid sure. really well um 
but you can, but like, but so, but no, let me, so we'll, we'll kind of go through it. So what does that mean when you do that 70, 30, that means when you have profit, 70% of all the profit goes to the, the other people, your partners, your, your capital structure. Also, if you're doing a, a cost segregation study, right. That right. And right now, this is the last year for a hundred percent bonus. You need to be thinking about that. That's why you should be actively finding deals this year is, um, 70% of that cost segregation study goes to your investor pool. Now, I like to make my investors money, right? But I've, what I've learned is you don't have to make them punch drunk. And, I, and, and what happens is a lot of people become a slave to the money. Because like, listen, we all think money is in real estate, right? But that's not the truth. The money is in the money. The real estate's the vehicle, right? But like... Guys that are syndicators that are really good, they make lots of money because they know how to attract capital. Sure. The vehicle is real estate, but the real money is made in the money. Yep. That's a really neat concept if you think about it. That's why you should really get really good at raising and attracting capital to you because it's way more valuable uh, in the end of the day. Okay, so that's that's the typical structure. Are you, is everybody following me? Are you following me, Sterling, right? That yep. green, right? That's what it is. Sure. And so now if you go out and you crush a deal because you are good, you found a great deal and you executed your plan and it went way above what you ever thought possible. What do your investors get in that, that current structure? They get to come along with the ride. Sure. And all of a sudden they could be making, you know, what was maybe an 18% IRR. They're making 25, 30, and everybody's like, yes, that's great. Investors are happy. But what did she just do? She set an expectation that every deal is going to be like that. Yeah. Right? And um, did you really get to win as much as you should for your hard effort? I, I don't believe so. So here's what I've, this is, so I started my deals like that. That's how I started. And then, so this is going to sound contrary to everybody listening to this, but I'm going to tell you, if you're not doing this, you're not thinking about the money game. The money's in the money. And if you think about it from my perspective, being a financial advisor. So I'm going to ask one question, Sterling. It, when, if you were a financial advisor and you're looking across and you're sitting across from people and they say, hey, Sterling, what return should I expect from you as a financial advisor? What rate are you going to tell them? In the market? Yeah. Seven percent, boom. Six, yep. Six to eight. Yeah, on a right? good day. On a good day. Yeah, on a good day. So most financial advisors, and how much money is in that? In like mutual funds, I mean trillions upon hundreds of trillions of dollars. Most people that are saving money have money in the market, and it's and their financial advisors sitting across the table and saying six to eight. If any, now, when I first started as a financial advisor, I used to say, you know, like, oh, we're going to try to get you 12, right? Because you want to, like, and you learn that's a bad idea. You, you learn that you say six to eight, because if you hit six and eight, you keep their money. If you say 12 and it goes eight, they leave, they go to another brokerage. Sure. And the biggest trap in, in Wall Street is you want assets under management. You want the money to stay in the house. Yeah. So they're already getting six to eight money. And here we are as syndicators offering something that's like 18% or more. Now, for that person looking at that deal, 18% looks like what? What's the word for it? If you're going from six to eight and you go to 18, what's, what would you call that? I would call it risky. Yeah. Any. Yeah. That is, that's the, I called, I was offering somebody money the other day, some older guy had been in real estate for forever. And he was like, and I, I think I, I was offering him like 20% or something. He was like, can I give you some advice? Don't ever offer anybody 20%. He goes, it sounds like, you know, there's some other shady shit going on. He's like, people just are not used to those kind of returns. Exactly. Now, who is used to those kinds of money? the smart money, right? Wall Street, big people with money that go to these events looking for you, the sucker 
that wants freaking money. And they will suck it all from you because they know the rules to the game. Mm -hmm. Right. And I guarantee you, most of those, a lot of those guys are getting, giving their investors six to eight and they're taking 18 from you and making the Delta. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, man, I, 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 I I propose a different way. And and now I'm going to give you my different way. Right. So what I started doing and so I don't know if I said it. You got to. I didn't say the. Uh, you got to challenge your capital. Okay, that's what I meant to say earlier. You got to challenge your money. You start at something. And you start challenging it, right? And some people are going to be like, "Well," and when I say challenge it, I mean you give them less. You get them hooked on you. And but like you should because if you're the more you get a better track record, you shouldn't have to pay more. You should be like that's why REITs get formed because whoever was doing it got better and better and better, so they formed a, a true. Um, real estate investment trust. fund now they're, yeah. now they're getting seven percent yeah maybe five yeah and so that's the way the money that's how wall street works so you got to think like that and so what i started doing is listen when i do my deals i set up my uh i have a shares and b shares and then i'll do and i'll do a 50 50 ownership of the shares 50% to the A shares, 50% to the B shares. Now, the B shares is my partnership group, my whoever I'm going to have in my deal with me, okay? And now, but the only thing I really share 50-50 is my depreciation, okay? Um, because I'm going to define their payout in my A share box. And this is way different than when anybody does it. But I'm going to tell you, it, it rewards you for being a good um, a good operator, and it still takes care of your investors, right? So I do what's called a six, I'll call it for a long time, I've done six and six. Now I've I actually just did a six and 12. And I'll show you what that means, right? But um, because I had a big raise, right? But like on a typical three or $4 million deal, we may probably just do what's called a six and six. And that's where to my A shares, I say, listen, it's a 6% pref, right? So if you give me $100,000, you're going to make 6% a year or $1,500 a quarter. And then upon sell or exit, I'm going to give you another 6% annualized for every year we've been in the deal. So like that, just kind of like if they put you $100,000 and it waits for five years, 6,000 times five years is 30 grand. They're going to make an additional uh, $30,000. $30, so I paid them 30 along the way. And so they made $60,000 or 12%. Mm -hmm. So six and six is 12, right? Now on some of my bigger deals, like I, I got a deal right now that we're doing, it's six and 12. So it's 18%. And it's a, it's a $15 million raise and I don't want any issues. So you can get money faster to come into you if you have a bigger raise, right? Um, but I don't always do the six and 12. So it's a big deal when I offer a six and 12. Right. So most people are used to Corey's six and six game. So how is that? How is that structured exactly? Um, the way it I mean, reads is in it, my PPM. Is yeah. it? How, yeah. How does it read your PPM? Because I mean, it, it sounds almost like debt. Are you guaranteeing those returns or? I know it's just pref. Okay. Pref, right? So pref on the 6% upon sell, it's pref. So in other words, it's it reads like this. So, um, Six percent, six print pref, right? That yeah, I have to pay that no matter what, right? Sorry for my mic. Um, for cash flow, anything above that six percent is mine to keep, right? And then upon sale, um, the first thing gets paid is the you know the the note, right? And then everybody's principal, and then it's a hundred percent from that till they get. Um, it says you know a total of twelve percent, including their pref. Mm -hmm. So it just fills up their bucket all the way. And that's 100% of the funds goes to do that. And once that's done, then I get all the upside left over. So I've put my investors on the front of the cash flow side and the back end side 100% until they get their bucket filled up. There's no 50, 50, 70, 30 split. There's no waterfalls where, sure. you know, so I have to absolutely perform and hit all their numbers or Corey doesn't make it because you also got to look at the downside. What happens if the deal doesn't do well, right? right. Well, Corey will make no money, right? And I'm cool with that because I know my ability. 
But if I go out and kill it, then, um, and I just did this. I got a real live example. I bought, I mean, I bought this property, the Palms, um, in, it was actually called Catalina Village when we first bought it, but I bought it for 9.5 million, right? And we can use that kind of as a, as a, an idea of what would happen. Sure. So I did my 50, 50 split, but I had a six and six in there. So it's 12% to my investors, right? Um, I paid them $6,000 a year in cash flow. And then at the end, we, we actually get an offer. We sell it for 19 million bucks. <clears throat> so let's just call it, we made 10 million profit, net profit, right? So um, if I, and I, I think I raised one, no, I raised 3.4 million. 3.5 million, right? So three, five, 3.5 million times 6% is 210,000, right? Times, if I want to give them the back six, because I'm paying this first six along the way, right? For three years. And then on the seller disposition, I've got a, uh, the other six times three years. So 210 times three is what, 600,000? Mm-hmm. So I paid them $600,000 and I filled up their bucket. Can you feel that now? Can you feel that weight? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there was $10 million profit. I gave them 3.4 million or well, and, and it wasn't all 10. So like there was $10 million of profit, but like, I think we had to you know, subtract the 3.4 mil uh, of money or 3.5. So maybe there was $7 million left. Right. Or seven, or seven five or something or, yeah it's seven million well no because if you if you Six, sold five. it if you sold it for 19 the 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 initial equity comes out of that right if you if you raise three million yeah so i can't remember nine, exactly i have to look, yeah we made something like probably eight or nine million dollars probably it doesn't matter like because the math right. doesn't change. no i, I yeah no, i, I paid six hundred thousand dollars to my investors right on the back end they were whole and Corey made a, a pretty good size sizable profit right and do you think my investors cared that i made a lot of money no no do they go into my next deal 90 percent of them did which that's pretty typical 90 you know i didn't do a 1031 exchange because i had other uses for some of my money and some of the investors didn't want to go either. So we just, we just sold it. And, um, but like, that's the real, that's real. That's what happened. So if I was to do it the other way and had a 70, 30 split you make on a two property instead of seven <laughs> word up. Yeah. Right. So I'm telling you to split this setup and go. And, and, and now, now let me make it make sense to you. Like, and you said it earlier, Certainly, if you told someone 20%, they're not fishing. If they're making six to eight and you say 20, they're like, that's too much, dude. Something's mm -hmm. fishy. I don't ever pitch money like that. I pitch it as six. And I, I said earlier, six and six, six and 12, right? And then we also, we've created like A-1, A-2, A-3. Sure. Sometimes we'll go uh, six and six, six and eight, six and 10, and have a 100,000, 300,000, 500,000 breakpoints. If you give me more money, you get a better return. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's a, way, a great way to get and investors. Some guys, Sometimes yeah. some guys is like, well, I only have 300,000 and I really want the deal. We'll go find two other partners, create an LLC and come in with 500K. Sure. Right. Well, I can do that. Yeah. Just come on in. Right. And so you show them ways and then they'll go out and raise the money for you nice right so lot, lots of little tricks there right but 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 here's how i sell this thing john so and but also you got to understand your ad this only works if you're talking to the right avatar right if yeah. so i fish so there's always ponds and there's like your honey holes and yeah. so you have different fish different ponds to go fish in and listen those trophy uh bass Sometimes there's not very many of them, but when you find them, um, it, you know, it costs your gear. I don't know. I'm trying to think about that and analyze it Fishing to like wall analogy. street money. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're hard to find when you find them, they're there, but they're super expensive. It costs a lot of money. I would just be in a nice medium sized honey hole where everybody, they like any of the bait that I throw out. Right. They're not very selective. Um, they've got funds they are ready to deploy. That's my, that is, I call it dumb money from smart people. 
And dumb money for me is anything that's in the stock market. Right. That's my avatar. That's who I market to. I don't try to go to events or any other place to find money because it's shark tank money. Sure. Right. I want people that are looking for me that are wanting an alternative to the stock market because they want to get off the roller coaster. Right. Right. So when I pitch in, I say, Hey, listen, our investments are six and six. And I usually go through that exercise. Like, you know, what does your advisor tell you a good return is 6%, right? They say six to eight, always, almost always. I said, well, you know, now, now let's put you in retirement, Sterling. So now let's say you're retired and you're going to start pulling money from your financial, from your account. What is your advisor going to tell you? What, what kind of rate of pool should you be coming, should be coming from your investments? Do you know what that number is? What do you think that number, what advisors tell you? Do you know? 4%? Yeah, I'm going to say three. Most, okay. most advisors will tell you, I got a million dollars set in my account. And then, you know, you need to live off of 3% of that money. Maybe four, but probably three. Three would be safer. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at that saying, wait a second. I got a million dollars I've saved. You're telling me I can make $30,000 in income? They're like, that doesn't do crap for me. Right. <laughs> like that doesn't set them up for, they're already thinking that's not going to work. Right. But then they talk to me and say, Hey, listen, you know, here's what my, my thing does. You know, everybody that we know uh, pays rents and, you know, renters expect rents to go up too, by the way. And we never disappoint them. <laughs> right. We always, we always, we always raise the rents, no matter what, always, even if it's just a little bit, right? You always deliver. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, but because they're paying rent and the way we structure our deals, we can pay a 6% payer. I'm like, do you know anything in your financial advisor that you can get from your financial advisor right now that will pay you 6% and give you a check and not touch your principal? And there's nothing out there, by the way. Like mm -hmm. if you go safe stuff, CDs, less than one, bonds, maybe a good bond, but, but maybe not. And then, mm -hmm. and then after that, you're in the stock market with you know blue chip stocks or mutual funds, or maybe there's an insurance product, but it's just all different. So a 6% payer is like, I took your 30,000 and now I made it 60,000. Mm -hmm. Well, and you're that's, growing. yeah. And then it's like that story, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Bill right? Mays. <laughs> right. And so, you know, then that's when I tell them like rents always go up. We never disappoint them. And so we raise the rents, we raise the value. So when we sell, we have additional profit for you. And that's that other 6% annualized. So that's your COLA. Now, old people understand COLA. That's called the cost of living adjustment, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're living for a long time and inflation is real. Today, it's realer than ever. Yeah, for sure. And so you got to have something to combat it. And so that's what that back end does. And so on our six and 12, that's huge. That's 18% money. So they're like, they want to live off the check, but they want a back end piece to grow their wealth. And so that's what we do. And that's how I sell it. And it doesn't look as scary as saying, I'm going to give you 18% or 20%. It's no, I'm going to give you a 6% paycheck. And then we're going to share in the profit on the back end. And, and for them in their mind, it, we, we, and I've not even talked, I've not said IRR. I've not said all this multiples and shit like that. Because no one yeah. understands that shit, by the way. I have a hard time explaining IRR to people. I just don't even go there. I just talk about dollars. I talk to investors with dollars. You give me a hundred thousand, you make six thousand dollars a year. You know, um, if it's six and twelve, you're gonna make an additional twelve thousand dollars a year. You know, for every year that you hold it. Sure. And so they're like, okay, I get it. So I show them the math. I'm like, that's what it looks like. So they're like, yeah, that makes sense. I want that. Cool. cool and so, cool. Uh, anyways, that's how I raise money, bro. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Real quick, I want to hop to our radio round for the sake of time. Uh, just three quick questions to help our listeners get to know you a little bit better. The first one is, what's your favorite book? Um, I like The Richest Man in Bob Babylon. Um, okay. It's a, a tenth of everything I, I, I make is mine to keep. And I'm actually reading a new book. Um, a CEO Only Does Three Things by Trey Taylor. And okay. that book right now has been really great for me to grow um, as I'm really trying to... Um, level up in my company awesome what's your favorite quote 
Um, the journey is the reward. Nice. And I think that's by Homer. Awesome. Awesome. And what's your favorite thing to do when you're not working? Uh, rock crawling, right? I got a Jeep. That's, yeah. that's insane. And, uh, I just like to go out. I just like to get out, man. Anything that has to do with not work. Sure. That's like, you know, uh, and I like, and vacations. We go lots of vacations. Hawaii is my favorite, obviously, but we go a lot of places. And so vacationing and rock crawling. Awesome. Awesome. How can our listeners get in touch with you, find out more about you, learn from you, invest with you? Yeah. The best way I would love to give your people a, one of my, my book, I, uh, it's called copy your way to success, but if they'll uh, text the word book, B O O K to 480-500-1127, 480-500-1127 text the word book. We'll send it to them for free. Awesome. Awesome. I'm going to do that and get me a copy. Um, Corey, thank you so much for joining, man. I really, really enjoyed it. Really learned a lot and uh, always appreciate keeping up with you on your journey. Rock and roll, brother. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to the Rent Roll Radio Show brought to you by Crestworth Capital. We hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please hit the subscribe button and leave us a rating and review. You can also visit us at CrestworthCapital.com or RentRollRadio.com or follow us on Facebook at RentRollRadio or at Crestworth Capital. If you would like to reach us, feel free to shoot us an email at info at RentRollRadio.com or sterling at CrestworthCapital.com. We hope you come back next week to join us on some more of our journey. Until then, happy investing. <laughs>